You know, Eric, on this show, time and time again, founders talk about the importance of hiring great employees. And they always say it's so hard and so important early on to hire the right person. It makes a lot of sense that it's difficult because most founders don't have experience doing high-level searches or hiring top-level talent. And they're also limited to their local talent pool a lot of the times. That's why a lot of founders choose to work with SPMB, one of the fastest growing executive search firms in the country. For over 40 years, SPMB has specialized in recruiting upper management and board members to early stage VC funded startups and larger growth stage companies too. They bring the knowledge of a large global firm and combine it with the personalized service and attention of a boutique. They have a dedicated team focusing on the Mountain West and Midwest emerging tech markets. So no matter where you are in the country, if you're trying to hire top level talent, SPMB can help you out. If that sounds like you, you can go to upside.fm slash SPMB to learn how they are closing hundreds of C-level searches annually. Because of the way this market is, and just the level of, you know, frankly, capital that's that's going into it, there's a lot more creative ways to kind of get involved in the ecosystem. The startup investment landscape is changing, and world-class companies are being built outside of Silicon Valley. We find them, talk with them, and discuss the upside of investing in them. Welcome to Upside. Woo! Hello, 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 and welcome to the Upside Podcast, the first podcast finding upside outside of Silicon Valley. I'm Jay Klaus, and I'm accompanied by my co-host, Mr. New Face of Finance himself, Eric Hornung. Jay, it is a new day. We're rising. We're here. We're up. It's early, and we're excited about finance. I'm excited about finance. When will you consider yourself one of the new faces of finance? We're still a long ways off. I mean, there's a stark difference between the reach that the group that I have deemed the new faces of finance has and what we have here on Upside. But we're progressing. We're progressing. You're progressing. And here's the thing about the new faces of finance. It's always changing. There's always new faces popping up. When I started this concept, could you have said that Packy McCormick was a new face of finance? No, he wasn't even around. But now he is. And now he's one of the top dogs. So you never know what's happening. New people breaking in all the time and people need help breaking into places like finance, places like VC. These are some opaque areas that take a little bit of guidance to figure out how to get into this space. What what's the curriculum to break into VC? I feel like when I was looking at going into it, it was just read a bunch of books, accidentally start a podcast, and then maybe it would work out. And we still haven't broken into VC. But (laughs) Maybe if we would have spent a little bit more time reading the blog of today's guest, we could have gotten there because today we are speaking with John Gannon, the co-founder and general partner of Going VC. Going VC was founded in 2016 with the goal of providing individuals with a more concrete pathway into venture capital and has continued to grow into a vibrant, collaborative, and inclusive community of like-minded individuals who have the common goal of advancing their careers in the field. Eric, through Going VC, John has mentored thousands of current and aspiring VCs with his career blog and has uh, subscribers from top firms like Sequoia, KPCB, and Bessemer. Jay, I feel like this is the kind of blog that we have heard about so much, or I have. Whenever people reach out to me and they're like, hey, I'm getting into VC, I'm already doing the John Gannon thing. I'm already subscribed to his blog. That's like, you know, I said, how do you get in earlier? This is really kind of step one. You subscribe to this newsletter. I think you actually put John on my radar years ago at this point. One of our early aspirational guests that we kind of let slip through the cracks and now we've circled back, we've closed the loop and I'm excited about it because people who want to break into VC typically are trying to live this one life they have to live the best way that they can. And if you want to learn how to live the one life you have the best way you can, you can visit our friends at Ethos Wealth Management. You can go to upside.fm slash ethos to learn more. Here's the thing about that early, those early days, Jay, when we were sending out some cold emails, we had our little reach list. I feel like we're, we're starting to cross a couple of them off. There's a couple out there though. There's a couple out there just hanging for us to, you know, have on the podcast. That's right. One day at a time, we'll make them all 
guests of the pod, get them in the pod folio. But first, today, we're going to speak with John. Let us know what you think about this episode. You can tweet at us at UpsideFM or email us hello at Upside.fm. And we'll get to that interview with John right after this. I hate that we've demonized scheduling links, Jay. Scheduling links are actually one of my favorite things. I love the ease of someone saying, here's when you can book a time with me. And then I can choose when it's best for me too. Whenever I get an outreach and someone says, what time looks good for you? I ask them, hey, do you have a scheduling tool? And you know what scheduling tool I wish they had? Which one is that? It's a new scheduling tool called SavvyCal. SavvyCal makes it easy for both parties to find the best time to meet. SavvyCal makes the scheduling process even more savvy than any other scheduling tool that I've seen, and I mean that. It makes it so easy to personalize your link. You can say, hey, this is a meeting time for Jay and Eric, and it just looks so professional, so sophisticated. So much so that we're going to be using it for Upside going forward, and maybe even rolling it out to the Upside network. You can use SavvyCal as well. You can sign up for a free account at SavvyCal.com slash Upside. That's S-A-V-V-Y-C-A-L dot com slash Upside. And when you're ready to upgrade to a paid plan, you can use the promo code Upside for a free month. On Upside, we like to start with a background of the guest. So can you tell us about the history of John? Sure. I'll try to go through it as quickly as possible so we can hit some of the high notes. Yeah, hit the high notes. Yeah. I grew up in Massachusetts, go Sox, really, uh, you know, had a very kind of typical middle class upbringing there. And my introduction to the working world was actually in retail. I worked at a place called Filing's Basement where I was basically putting clothes on racks and helping people in the store. I also had other jobs, worked at a fish market that was uh, down the street from my house, which was uh, definitely a formative experience. But I sort of meandered my way into tech during high school. And this was back in the day of dial-up internet service providers to, to sort of put a, put a date or a, a kind of a date range on it. And I was, uh, was immediately hooked. I just really enjoyed technology. I really enjoyed seeing how it affected people's lives. And, and that was really the start of my, my tech career in high school and then went off to college, studied computer science, and then did a bunch of, of things from there, uh, really mostly in the software industry, a lot of focus on internet infrastructure, worked at companies like VMware, uh, Amazon Web Services. And then as we kind of got more mid-career, I got more mid-career, I took a turn into the startup and, and venture world. So I ended up going to Columbia Business School and really focusing my time there, trying to get into the venture capital industry. And this was back in 2008, which 2007, 2008, which as you know, there were a lot less firms, a lot less capital. It's a very different kind of market for startups and venture and venture investment. So that was really when I kind of got on the path to starting the blog and the newsletter and, and sort of all the things that, that came after that was really based out of my own, scratching my own itch when I was trying to break into venture capital and just sort of how hard it was and how there really wasn't a lot of information out there and trying to open that up to, to other folks so that they could take advantage of that and, and use it in their own uh, job search process. Yeah, talk a little bit about the beginning of the blog. Was that a medium for you to try to display your skills as someone that could get into venture? Was it to to document your process trying to get into venture? What what did you think the blog would be? Yeah, so the blog was actually really just me saying, hey, I found a lot of interesting stuff that really helped me when I was in my VC job search. And so I wanted to take those same resources and, and simply just curate them and put them out there for other people to be able to use. There was no grand plan in terms of, I want this thing to, to grow into, to, to a business or anything like that. It was, it was purely from the fact that frankly, I just got excited about helping people with jobs. And I've always been that kind of person who's helped people with their job searches. I got a taste of blogging in business school. Actually, I I blogged throughout my business school experience was not uh, as widely read as, as my current blog and, and newsletter that I have now, but it was a great experience and really kind of hooked me on the whole idea of blogging and being able to reach, even if it's just a small audience and, and really connect with them and really help with them 
Like I would be maybe at a business school happy hour while I was in school and someone would say, oh, like you're the guy who writes that business school blog about Columbia Business School, right? And so those kinds of interactions really kind of hooked me on blogging. And then when I got out of school, I had the venture job. I saw there was another kind of opportunity really to help people. And that's when I started uh, what's known as the, the John Gannon blog or the VC careers blog. And why'd you, why'd you stick with it after all of that? Like what was the impetus to, I mean, you have a venture job, you're working in tech, you went to business school, you did the whole thing. Why keep that running and keep essentially a full-time job on the side? Yeah, I, it's a good question as to why I continue to, to sort of uh, do what I do in terms of the, the blog and the newsletter. I just, uh, and, and, and you guys probably can uh, empathize with this because you, you have a, a podcast here and you're, you're producing things regularly, you're making things regularly. I do definitely enjoy the creation of, of, of content and trying to think of like different angles that other people haven't thought of and trying to, to, to sort of educate them and help them and, and, and say things maybe a little bit differently or giving a different spin to it. But frankly, a lot of it, and, and this is, I think, the trick to some of this stuff, and, and I think you guys might be able to, to, to sort of uh, see this in your own work as well, is that just forming that habit of creating something on a schedule on a weekly basis once you get in that groove, it's it it feels really weird to get out of it. And and it's funny. I'll talk to my wife about this. I'm like, well, you know, today I like I have to write the newsletter. She's like, what do you mean you have to write the newsletter? I'm like, no, I I actually have to write the newsletter today. So I think once you do it enough and your brain kind of gets trained in that way, you really can kind of lock in. And like, I don't, I, I can't see myself not doing this, right? I can see myself doing this for another 10 years, 15 years, uh, simply because it's it's become a habit. Then the challenge becomes, how do you keep it fresh and creative? And I'm always looking for ways to to, to kind of mix it up and, and try some new things uh, in, in sort of the medium that I that I work in. I've been writing for a few years now and every at least every year, if not every like six months, I, I ask myself like, what, what am I doing here? How do I continue to make this more narrow and more specific and more referable even? Have there been any notable changes or differences in the way that you've thought about the blog over the years? Yeah, I think one thing that I am, am much more proactive about or, or had started doing, I would say a few years ago, is being more deliberate in terms of seeking out different and diverse voices that I would highlight in the content that I was creating. So say five years ago, I would just look for things that I found just, just interesting, but I wouldn't really seek out voices that weren't necessarily in my Twitter stream by default. Right. And I started to do that and put some of those things that I, that I find into my newsletter and the, all the the things that I put in are things that I, I genuinely like. It's just that now I'm putting more of a deliberate effort into just looking in you know sites, blogs, Twitter streams, et cetera, that, that maybe I wasn't looking in before. And so I think that uh, really helps my readers get different perspectives and also helps me, right? I, I get different perspectives as well. And I think that's a good and healthy thing and, and helps us all learn. Talk to me about turning it from the blog itself into like how did going vc launch out of the vc careers blog so going vc like i think any good startup was a initially a, a side project <laughs> so i had been running the newsletter and the blog for for many years and i had started to create some products to help folks who were trying to break into the business. And I would say 99% of the folks who are on my email list, they leverage all the free content and things that I create and they're able to get results with that, which is awesome. But there's that that 1% who wants a little bit more, right? They wanna go a bit, a bit deeper. Maybe they want a more interactive experience. So I ended up rolling out some online courses and, and, and some coaching as well, one-on-one -on -one coaching. But what I found is that there was there was still a gap and the gap was really when I thought back to my experience trying to break into VC when I was in business school, there was really no community to plug into. So when I was at Columbia Business School, there were maybe three or four other people besides me who were like really wanted to get into venture capital. And so we were like kind of a tight knit group, but it was three or four people, right? And so I saw that there was an opportunity 
where I had built an audience around folks who were looking to break into venture capital. And also because I had been at it for a long time, there were venture capitalists in my audience as well, right? So maybe they had read my newsletter and then three years later, they they in venture and then two years later, they're a principal or something like that, right? So that dynamic, I said, what if we could get on a weekly basis, VC job seekers and VCs basically to just hop on a like a Zoom call and just have that VC share some of the specifics of their background, their sector focus, maybe some specific aspects of how they do they, their job, right? And just make it like an interactive experience. And let's spin up a Slack group too, and we'll put all the folks in there and, and let's kind of see what, what happens. And so what ended up happening was, was ultimately going VC cohort one. We are actually right now, as we're recording in the middle of, of the admissions period for going VC cohort nine. And we've had 300 plus folks go through that program and over 40% of them end up working in a, a venture type of role. So it could be a VC, it could be a venture studio, an accelerator, things like that. And yeah, it, it just sort of, again, was just, just a side project in a sense. Saw a gap in the market and really been able to scale it over the last couple of years by partnering up with uh, my co-founder who uh, came in and, and basically runs the business as, as the CEO. And we work together to, to scale gro- going VC, but his focus is really that day-to-day operational aspect. And then for me, I really chip in with the pieces that are, are sort of specialized to me in terms of, of my network and some of the things like that, that I've just built that, that brand over the, the last, I guess, 12 plus years now in the VC space. 40% placement success rate seems really high for this industry. What types of on-ramps does the program provide or how much of that comes from student outreach after the program versus the program has now surrounded you with people who can help get you into this industry? Yeah. So in terms of the, the success rate, in terms of people getting jobs, there's a few different pieces of the program that really contribute to that. I think just number one, the, the types of folks who apply for the program, you don't apply for a program like this unless you are very, very certain that you would like to work in venture capital, right? So there's sort of a self-selecting aspect there where you're just getting these like super motivated people from all walks of life, right? It's not just folks who went to Stanford or are going to be getting an MBA at Harvard, right? We've got folks coming from all different backgrounds all over the country and even internationally now, which has been kind of a surprise, frankly, that we've got folks now who are applying from different geographies and, and enrolling from different geographies. But in terms of like the, the the pieces of the program and the alumni network that really help, I think, drive the success rate. So there's certainly an educational component. So we have a 16-week uh, educational program where we're basically bringing in VCs as well as folks from the venture ecosystem with relevant experience to really teach the different aspects of venture, be it sourcing, due diligence, cap tables, right? All this, these different pieces that you need to know as an investor, we're covering them in that 16 week program. And we bring in folks from a variety of different venture firms and organizations. Some are folks that, that, maybe are just getting started and, and not as well known. And then we've got other folks. Uh, just last week, we had uh, Elizabeth Yin from Hustle Fund who came in and, and gave a session and talked about fundraising. We've had uh, Thomas uh, from Redpoint come in and talk about SaaS and, and metrics, right? So, so bringing not only that educational experience, but also allowing folks to really expand their network by helping them get in touch with these, these folks in the industry who have had some success is a big piece of this. The community aspect, right, is another pillar, which is super, super important in that in a cohort, maybe we have, say, 70, 80 people, right, who are all focused on that same goal. And so there's a tremendous amount of leverage that they get because we're, they're, in essence, in this community and everyone is really pulling each other, pulling for each other to succeed in that community. And so it could be anything from, hey, I'm interviewing next week with a venture fund in the Valley and I need to work on a investment memo. Does anyone have any tips or samples? Or it could be, hey, I'm looking at ICOs in the blockchain space and could really use someone to potentially give me some feedback on some of these things that I'm evaluating, right? So all that kind of comes through the community. And then one more big piece of this is we actually, you know, going VC, 
it's myself, it's my partner, but we actually have a team, right? And part of that team is our career services team. And so they are focused on figuring out based on someone in the program and, and sort of their interests, goals, where they're trying to go is really helping them to make sure that they've got their resume in a good place to identify that when there are firms that are hiring to be able to potentially give them a route directly through another member in the program to connect with that firm or through, uh, it could be members of the, the, the staff or the team as well or myself, right? So kind of opening up the network and really tapping into that in a major way for folks in the program, that's, I would say, the, the, the third piece of really what drives that success rate. How's that network changing? On Upside, we've seen, at least in the last two years, it's at least become more on our radar that there's a lot more innovation happening in like early stage investing. There's crowdfunding, there's syndicates, there's micro LPs, there's rolling funds, there's maybe more professionalized angels. How's all of that playing into what you're seeing in terms of a network and in terms of optionality for people within your audience and is it affecting best practices at all? Yeah, so it's a good good call out. And I probably should have mentioned that it's the fourth piece of, of what we do and how people see success in the program. But we started going VC partners, which is our investment arm. And we've invested in now close to 20 early stage companies. And the going VC partners really is driven by our community. So the uh, company sourcing, diligence, et cetera, is actually done by the, the community, the members of the program. So they're actually able to pick up experience in all of the aspects of venture, all the way down to check writing. They don't, they don't have to write a check, right? But, but you know, we write a check and we've built, an, in essence, an LP network that writes checks into these companies. And so today we're using uh, sort of an, an SPV model, which you're, I'm sure, pretty familiar with. And, you know, in the future, we'd like to go down more of an institutional road and be able to deploy capital in that fashion as well. But in terms of the creativity, like you were saying, yeah, there's, there's a, we even see it folks within our community are spinning up their own SPVs and they're investing through that mechanism and, and forming their own LP bases. We've, we see that actually quite frequently now. So yeah, I think there's a lot of innovation there just in terms of like, I think there's just a lot more folks that are kind of getting in business, uh, even if it's for a deal or two a year to, to be, be running some kinds of syndicates. Also, I think what we're seeing on the syndicate side is there actually opportunity to really team up with other syndicates. And that was something that was a, frankly a surprise to me. I had always just sort of outside looking in thought like, oh, like there's a syndicate and they source deals, they invest in things and, and that's kind of it. But there's actually collaboration that goes on. And, and we've seen that firsthand in, in going VC, actually in some of our investments as well, which has been been really interesting and, and something I didn't expect. A lot of going VC and VC careers is about getting a job in venture. Do you see anyone, or do, how often are people coming out and like launching a fund instead of getting a job? So in terms of folks who want to work in VC versus start their own fund, we definitely slant towards folks who either want to break in and, and also in the recent, I'd say, couple of years, we, we actually see early career VCs. We're looking to just kind of grow in their career, join the program as well, which was something we didn't necessarily expect, but it's been really great to, to have folks like that involved. But in terms of the split between folks who want to join a fund versus launch a fund in our program, it definitely skews more towards the, the join a fund crowd. And that's, I think, just by virtue of, of my audience and a lot of folks who, who follow me and follow Going VC, right, are in that, in that boat. But we do have folks who are actively looking to certainly start their own funds or, or their own syndicates. So we, we see some of that too. And I think that that actually is, it, it's sort of like a, a way to kind of hack your way into venture. And because of the way this market is, and just the level of, you know, frankly, capital that's that's going into it, there's a lot more creative ways to kind of get involved in the ecosystem, be it creating your own SPVs. You also see accelerators, right? Who they they've they've got their accelerator, but then they they create a fund that's that's kind of related to it, right? There's there's all these different 
sort of dynamics that are that are going on. And I think folks in Going VC really view it as a way to expand their network, expand their educational base, uh, expand their deal flow, right? If they are in our, uh, we call it the investor program, then they're definitely seeing additional deal flow as well. And I think all those things uh, kind of can help someone whether or not they want to join a venture firm or if they want to start their own fund and, and kind of everything in between. You mentioned there's a lot more capital in the market right now. You know, there are new firms getting stood up all the time. So in my mind, it seems like since you started this blog in 2007, 2008, the supply of VC jobs has probably increased, but I imagine the demand for them has continued to increase as well. So I'd just love to hear from your standpoint, some of the trends you're seeing in available VC careers for people who are trying to break in. The supply of VC jobs is definitely much higher than back in, say, 2008, 2009, when folks didn't even really post jobs, right? It was just literally, you just talk to every firm you can. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully someone was hiring. One thing that is, I think, awesome in terms of people who are looking to get venture experience or venture type experience is there's, there's so many different ways now in the sense that you could volunteer for an accelerator. If there's a VC who runs some kind of a, a, a meetup, trying to find a way to perhaps volunteer for that and, and help out there. A variety of firms are doing fellowship programs, which are uh, sort of internship-like, but they'll wrap some programming around it as well, right? That's kind of a new thing. And there's a lot of opportunity there as well. And it's just more ways for people to get that, sort of like get on that first rung of the ladder, right? Because that 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 sort of first piece, that first thing that you can kind of get in your resume or talk about, right? That's the thing that you that you build on. And I think the great thing about venture in 2021 is that there are actually a lot of those opportunities. Now, there's more visibility as well in terms of venture as a career. So I think on the demand side, that definitely increases. But I think that the new opportunities through some of the the means that I mentioned, uh, they they sort of outweigh that. And I think overall, it, it makes it for a more kind of robust ecosystem of VC and VC type opportunities. The other thing I would say is, there's kind of hybrid models where you've got folks who are their operators, but they also do a little angel investing, right? Like there's a lot of different ways to to kind of work your way in the ecosystem. And I think kind of being open to some of these possibilities and not just getting locked in on the idea of like, like I must get a venture job, that actually might not be the right, the right next step. The right next step might be you maybe writing some of your own checks into startups. So, so there's, there's a lot of different ways to go at it. And I think being open to the fact that there's a lot of different paths to go down is, is pretty important for someone who wants to make a career in the venture ecosystem. Have you developed any theories or themes around what makes somebody particularly adept to go into VC? So one, one thing that I try to do when I'm talking about how to get a VC job or kind of how to position yourself in a way that'll make you a compelling candidate I try to, where possible, put in the sort of a, a framework so people can kind of use that as a way to map their experience to that framework and then fill in any gaps as necessary. So one of the uh, frameworks that I like to use is, I call it the, the five-legged stool. So there's five things that, that I think that VCs care about. And those five things are deal flow, right? They care about their own investors, like getting investors for their funds. Maybe if you're like Sequoia or something, like you don't care because you got people banging on your door, but most VCs, right? They, they, need, they need capital. Uh, helping portfolio companies with hiring is another aspect. That's something that a lot of VCs either claim it's a value add or they, they really want to try to add value in that way. So that's another leg of the stool. And then if you think about portfolio company M&A or partnerships is another aspect that's like quite important for uh, VC. And then the last one is follow on financings. So I have a company, I'm a VC, I do series A's. Well, like that company's got to do a series B, right? And I need to be as helpful as possible to help them to get to that next milestone. Because also that just means that my investment will get marked up, right? And, and, and it's sort of, it's just part of the job as a, as a VC. And so what I like to have people take a step back and think about is, hey, 
out of those five legs of the stool, like what are the legs that I have the most ability to contribute to, right? And it, it totally depends on your background. Like if you've worked in the family office space, well, you might have a real strength around the LP side of things. Whereas if you have a really strong network in a certain vertical or certain functional area, maybe the portfolio hiring piece is really where you stand out or that leg of the stool. And so as someone who's looking for a VC job, you stay, take a step back, look at those five legs and kind of figure out where your strengths are. That can be a good place to really lean in and, and sort of leverage in your search. What about any psychological predispositions? Are there any patterns that you see in that way for people who can approach any of these legs of the stool? One thing that, that I remember very clearly was when I was in business school, there was uh, someone who was a few years ahead of me who graduated. He went on to work in venture at a couple of really good firms. And he said to me, uh, John, if you, if you like the process of searching for a VC job, then, then you will like being a VC. And consequently, if you do not like that job search process, you will not like being a VC. And it's very, it was very true in terms of what I saw in practice, because if you are looking for a VC job, you need to do many of the things that a VC is already doing today. You need to be out there finding interesting companies that you think are investable. You need to be helping them connect with capital, connect with people who might want to go work for them with potential partners and customers, right? If you don't like doing that, you are just not going to like working in venture. And so I think folks who take to the search with that mindset and also realize that this could be a, this is not a, a six month job search, right? This could be something that, that takes you a few years and there's a few different stops along the way. And folks who kind of go into it with that attitude that, hey, that's okay. And, you know, I'm going to sort of enjoy the journey. I think of the folks who, who end up being successful. Looking at your LinkedIn, it seems like you've always had a collection of things going on at any one given time, along with the blog and along with going VC. I have to think at some point you've thought about what if I just only did going VC and only did the VC careers blog and seemingly decided not to do that. And I'd love to hear your thought process as to why or why not. Yeah, it's it's a good question and, and one that I particularly of late have, have really thought a lot about. So I don't have a direct answer on this one, but I, I can tell you what I like about having multiple sort of balls in the air, which is that I think it's really exciting when those different balls kind of complement each other. So the fact that I'm a product manager and there's a company maybe in the dev tool space who we come across through going VC partners and being able to kind of look at that company in a unique way with a specific set of experience and, and be able to have a strong opinion on that and also be in a position where I can be really helpful to the founders of that company. That sort of uh, interdependency, if you will, is really exciting to me. On the flip side is that you don't always get that interdependency. It's, it's not like every day that that kind of thing is happening, right? And so there's kind of a push and pull just when you're working on uh, a few different things. I think obviously with going VC and, and my blog, VC Careers, uh, technically they're, they're separate, but, but obviously a lot of the things that I do for one or the other, they, 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 they very much are interdependent and, and, and sort of one drives the other in a way. So yeah, like I said, that's something I'm, I'm kind of thinking through myself, but yeah, don't have a solution to the puzzle just yet. As we look into the end of 2021, getting into 2022, returning back to normal times, what are, what are you excited about with VC careers going VC? Anything we should be looking out for? Yeah. Now that the world seems to be, or I should say, you know, parts of the world seem to be getting back to more, more norm normalcy. I'm, looking forward to being able to get out there and really connect with people uh, you know, sort of in person and getting that that muscle going again because it, it just definitely atrophied over the last uh, several years or not several years but several several months that we've been in this pandemic so it felt like several years yeah yeah for sure and so I'm looking forward to, to kind of getting back out there 
a bit more. I also am really curious about how the world will take the lessons that were learned around remote work and how they will uh, be applied or, or not applied. So like I alluded to, I'm a product manager at DigitalOcean, which is a company that has been, I would say, 50%-ish remote for almost since the beginning. And so when the pandemic hit, the remote work culture structure, everything was already in place. So execution wise, we just kind of kept chugging along. But I have friends who work at larger, you know, huge publicly traded companies where their idea of remote work was, you know, basically you're on the same number of meetings every day. You're just staring at a screen to do it versus in a conference room, right? And and that is not remote work. That is just like punishment, right? And so I'm excited to see do 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 bigger companies figure out is there a way that they can actually take the best parts of remote work and and just really make a better workplace, better environment for for the people that are in those companies, and also give people options. I think people there's some people who are like, oh, I got to get to the office, got to get back, and like that's cool. Like th- those folks should have. There should be companies and cultures that that are really they they want that right, and I think folks who want that will gravitate towards those companies. But there's going to be other companies, right, which have more of this remote first kind of operating model, and those are going to attract different kinds of people. So it'll be interesting to see where all that shakes out. I think it's going to take a couple of years. I, I also think there's a lot of opportunity in. I think teaching people how to work remotely. I actually haven't really like it's sort of like yeah, we use Slack and we use Zoom, but that that's not that's not actually a remote work operating system or way of working. It's just like here's some tools and and figure it out. So I think there's going to be some opportunities around remote work. Maybe it's training, maybe it's sort of mentoring and and kind of networking in a world where you, maybe you're not necessarily going into an office as much. So I think there's some exciting opportunities there, potentially venture investable as well. We started this interview and you were talking about the newsletter and you liked having the practice of publishing on a, on a weekly basis. A lot of the reason I was excited about this interview and enjoyed this conversation so far is I relate to you in that you are a creator, you're an educator, but you're playing in the VC space. And a lot of times VC and creator economy seem like not contrasting, but very separate camps with a few people and firms that overlap. So I'd just love to hear your relationship to the creator economy and how it relates to the work you do in VC, if at all. Yeah, and I, I love that question because it's something that I've I've thought about a lot. And I think the when you read the blogs and TechCrunch, et cetera, not, nothing against them when they talk about the creator economy, but they really do focus on, it's almost like creator equals like someone on YouTube, right? And And I don't, I don't agree with that at all. Like I do consider myself a, a creator and coming up with different ways to to educate, different ways to, to, to sort of help the ecosystem. You know, for example, yes, I, I do a newsletter, but four years ago I said, hey, you know what? I think we need to have some more transparency around salaries and venture capital. So I launched or created the venture capital salary survey, right? And I think that 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 is a it's an act of creation, right? Made a thing, put it out there in the world, and so I think there's creators in 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 sort of every every space, right? You could be a creator in the music space, you can be a creator doing stuff on YouTube, you could be a you, you could be a creator that creates on Instagram. You look at uh, Thing Testing, for example, as a company that now has raised venture money from Forerunner, one of the top uh, sort of e-commerce focused firms out there. But that was really a, a, a creator who started on Instagram and was just sort of highlighting the, the brands and, and things that, that she found interesting and, and put that out there in the world, right? And I consider her a creator as well. So yeah, I think we need to broaden sort of the, the, the aperture in terms of thinking about creators. And, and I think for VCs who look at the creator economy, I think they really need to take a, like a, a wider look, right? It's not about just tools that can help a YouTuber make more money, right? It, there's actually a, an enormous market out there just even beyond the folks that are, are say, maybe doing stuff on YouTube or, or podcasts or, or things that are like more commonly associated with the word creator. John, this has been awesome. If people want to learn more about you or VC careers or going VC, where should they go? 
So if, if people want to learn more, they can go to johngannonblog.com or goingvc.com. And there's, like I said, a ton of free resources about VC job search, about venture investing, and sort of everything that wraps around those two things are out there and, and available. And please go visit, take a look, download, read, learn, and then you know share, teach, get it out there and make sure that we can kind of lift up the whole ecosystem in the process. Eric, do you know what my favorite part about podcast advertisements is? That people actually listen to them? Wow, you read my mind. It's almost like we've done this twice now. Yes, that people actually listen to them. Look, you're listening right now, dear listener. And me, I'm listening too. I'm listening to you, Jay, here on the Upside Podcast. And if you have a message that you want to share with the Upside audience, people who care about startups, investing, the middle of the country, this is a really great place to put that message because people will listen to it. And if you have an event or you just wanna get something out about your brand, your hiring, this is the perfect place for the upside.fm slash classifieds. That's our classified ad that can run on one to five podcast episodes. That's right. Typically we lock in sponsors for longer sponsorships, but we wanted to make this accessible to you and your message. If you have a message to share with our audience, go to upside.fm slash classifieds and get your ad on the airwaves. All right, Jay, we just spoke with John Gannon of Going VC and VC Careers blog. Holy hustle. He's got a lot of stuff going on. Not only is he a full-time product manager at DigitalOcean and doing all this on the side, all of this, quote unquote, that is Going VC is broken into the blog, the email list, the Going VC cohort program. He has a lot going on. He has a lot of opportunity, but I love seeing somebody combining two of my loves, Eric, which is the startup world, the technology world, plus being a creator and figuring out how to build an audience in a space and serve them well. Are you a uh, Seinfeld fan? Oh, yeah. Have you, you know, George, when he goes, world's colliding. Yes. <laughs> worlds are colliding. <laughs> that was like this episode for, for you. That, um, is, that is definitely how I felt. <laughs> That might be our cover uh, image. So I think that we kicked this episode off with the whole new faces of finance concept. And really what that is, is people applying the principles of the creator economy, which are enabled by this new wave of technology into finance. I mean, it's what I'm particularly interested in as well. I'm not as creator focused as you are, but the movements and the momentum there, I think is huge. And I think we can see it in finance. I think there's probably people applying those same two lenses of technology and media slash creator slash content into other areas. And it's having an impact. John told us that I think 43% of going VC members have either worked or are currently working in VC accelerator programs or venture studios coming out of that program. Little plug here, going VC cohort nine applications are open right now until July 11th at midnight. So if you enjoyed this conversation with John and you're interested in going VC, aha, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, then you might want to go to goingvc.com. That cohort application is open right now for the fall. And I'm terrible at time zones, but I believe it's 1159 Pacific Standard Time. So if you are a procrastinator like I am sometimes and you're on the East Coast, you get yourself a couple extra hours. It's really kind of July 12th. July 12th, 3 a.m., Extra there couple hours, bonus hours. Well, we're giving you a month of advance notice here, so hopefully you don't procrastinate that much. Eric, this gave me some vibes of our conversation with Peter Livingston as well. I enjoy hearing these people who are writers, kind of first and foremost, but writers who are serving this audience in the tech world. A little bit different. You know, John's not talking about companies directly. He's more so talking about ways to get into the investing side which is good because there's space for all of that. I love this structure. I think that we're going to see it applied to a lot of content as we continue this upside journey, Jay. And I think it's more of a kind of 10-year trend as well. I think we're going to see it hit other industries. We just saw A16Z launch Future, which is their media arm. I think all of this is going to the same idea, which is that companies see the need for media. Now, to you and I's point, If you start as a media company, if you start as a content company, is it easier to launch something else or vice versa? That is the age old debate. 
And I think we're building our own repertoire of the five-legged stool, to use John's terminology, which I want to just call out here in the outro because I think this is a really good framework. Five-legged stool, the components are one, deal flow, two, investors for the fund, three, helping portfolio companies with hiring, four, portfolio company M&A or partnerships, and five, follow-on financing. Those five legs can help you go VC, dear listeners. So if you are listening to this and you're interested in getting into that field, remember those five legs. Think about how you can help a company with them. Read John's blog and let us know what you think about this episode. You can tweet at us at UpsideFM or email us hello at Upside.fm and we'll talk to you next week. That's all for this week. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear what you think about this episode, so tweet at us at UpsideFM or email us hello at Upside.fm and let us know. You can learn more about us and browse our entire back catalog of episodes at Upside.fm. And if you love our show, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That goes a long way in helping us bring high-quality guests to the show. Rocky, I'm so